Okay, Rob, let's start. Okay. This is an amount of board. This is actually the previous generation of amount of board. This is the current one. We think that the color changed because we reported a bug upstream to them where their uh, their USB SD uh, their USB serial packets were mis tagged and were being discarded by Mac OS X's USB sanity checking. So even if you had a Linux VM under Mac OS X, you couldn't route the serial port through. You needed an actual Linux machine. The new ones, I'm told they fixed that. So hopefully if any of you do have a Mac that you know use Linux and VM under, that should work. That's fairly common in uh, slides that we gave at LinuxCon Japan. The talk we gave at January 52 was aspirational. It was talking about upcoming things, what we plan to do. At, at LinuxCon Japan uh, this, this spring, we actually did release um, some of this IP. What, what the goal of this is, is the Super H processor family had a lot of investment in it back in the 90s. It was highly tuned, optimized uh, assembly language. It had support in all the tool chains. It had Linux kernel support. It had debugger support. S-Trace worked with it. It was a widely supported architecture. And then its original manufacturer stopped investing in it. But the patents had expired. And now the last SH2 patent expired in October of last year. The last SH4 patents, I'm told that they expire sometime next year. So what we've done is we've implemented an SH2 processor and released the hardware source code, the VHDL, under a BSD license. We currently have a, a tarball of the VHDL build. This is Jeff Salmon. He maintains the VHDL build. You know, patches to it will go to him. But we initially developed it in Mercurial, and we made extensive use of subrepos. So exporting that to GitHub turns out to be kind of non-trivial. So I'm working on that, but I didn't have it ready by now, by this uh, talk. But in the next in the next week or two, I hope to have GitHub with a complete repository uh, with a complete repository history back to where we started. Now, part of the reason we're interested in open source hardware, the benefits of open source software started accruing around 1992 with Linux. Before that, there was the Free Software Foundation, but it wasn't taking advantage of the internet. They, they literally mailed magnetic tapes around, and they, they took you know, patches by modem on Usenet, and it wasn't particularly efficient. And then when Linus Torvalds at his university started doing all of the development on the internet with release early, release often, the, the book, uh, The Cathedral and the Bazaar, was actually a comparison between how the Free Software Foundation and the GNU project <coughs> developed software and how Linux developed software. It wasn't proprietary versus open. It was two different ways of doing open. So we have learned to make very good use of the internet so that people in Japan and people in Canada and people in Texas and people elsewhere can coordinate on the same, can collaborate on the same project project in real time. So in software, this is considered normal. In software, having a proprietary operating system means it has backdoors, it has exploits, 
it may come pre-installed with root kits in the BIOS. But on the hardware side, we accept closed hardware that comes as a black box from the manufacturer and you just get to choose between different vendors. That's the only choice you can make. Well, what we're trying to do is we are trying to take the benefits of open source collaborative development on the internet and extend it to hardware. Part of the question is, you know, why now? And we can, we can get into that, but the really quick version is, this was $50 retail and that included shipping. So the entry level, we can afford to give them away because they're cheap. This can run a processor capable, of a little system on, the, on chip in the FPGA, capable of booting Linux to a shell prompt with reasonable performance. I'd have to look up what the megahertz is. It's 66 or 150, something like that. It, it's not fire breathing. It's 15 years ago performance. But the entry level for a hobbyist who wants to just start out and try this is now very low. The, the, the way FPGAs work, I, I'm taking stuff a little out of order, but I'm not. I'm, I'm going quickly through the old slides and I'm diverging into material that this new talk is about, that we did give this talk before. An FPGA is essentially RAM with behavior attached. So when you write into this memory cell, what you're doing is you're connecting wires that say, send a signal to this AND gate, send a signal to this OR gate. You can assemble circuits by writing what's called a bit stream into the FPGA. And then the bit stream can be flashed into the board so that when the board reboots, it will automatically load that bit stream and the behavior will be persistent. And you can basically make one of these boards be one of these new processors. Um, we call it the J-Core processor rather than the Super H processor because even though the patents have expired, the trademarks have not. So it's J2, but it's instruction set compatible with SH2, except we added a couple of new instructions because SH2 stopped being developed before Futex is meant in. It never supported SMP. So we need Comp Exchange to do both of them sanely in the modern thing. It's, it's synchronization mechanisms were for older single processor key thread stuff and we needed, and we uh, backported a couple of barrel shift instructions from SH3. So it runs SH2, but it's actually slightly more powerful. So in these slides, you know, what is the minimal system that can run Linux? You basically need a CPU. You need a way of inputting data to the CPU, outputting data from the CPU, and those two can basically just be a serial port, a two directions of serial port. You need a, a clock to drive the processor. And you need, you know, it's a 33 megahertz, 66 megahertz, 150 that clock. And you need a timer interrupt to drive the scheduler to let you know when the next time slice is up. You need to attach it to some memory <coughs> to have programs you run, and you need to attach it to some storage to load to some persistent storage to load programs from. That's actually it. That is the simplest setup capable of running Linux. There's a whole bunch of stuff that uh, that you don't need. Um, you don't need video, you don't need audio, you don't need uh, a keyboard. Um, it's nice, you, your storage can be read-only. You can basically load the system from an RAMFS and what it writes to as the system is running is just you know temporarily stored in an RAMFS and then discarded later. Um, and the SH2 processor was what's called a NoMMU processor. It doesn't have a memory management unit with page tables. Now, there used to be a project called UC Linux that uh, Jeff Dion, the developer who uh, was indisposed today and couldn't come, uh, used to maintain that. He founded that project and he did it for many years. He was a hardware developer who wandered into the lowest levels of Linux development. And you know, in embedded Linux development, his project started a lot of the embedded Linux development. He was one of the founders of Linio. 
And then in 2003, he moved to Japan and handed his English projects off to other people who didn't maintain them particularly well. And UC Linux rolled to a stop. So one of the things that we've actually been doing uh, with this is we created a noamu.org website to replace the UC Linux website because UC Linux combined two things. It combined a distro, which is now full of obsolete packages from the 1990s, and it combined the place that you go to ask questions about NOMU programming, the place that collects the documentation, the place that collects kernel patches and, and sends them upstream to make sure that NOMU is supported on various targets. There was, it, it served as a condensation nuclei for this technical topic, and it was also a distro. So the death of the distro diminished its useful, greatly diminished its usefulness as a nexus for NOMU development. A lot of people in the past 10 years believe that, you know, no MMU Linux, nobody bothers to do that anymore because they ask, well, you know, where does no MMU Linux? Oh, go look at UC, you know, go look at UC Linux. This site hasn't been updated in, since 2005. But we're fixing that. Actually, a lot of people have been doing it. What they haven't been doing is contributing stuff to any upstream. They've been doing their own forks. There's a cold fire fork. There's a Cortex M fork. There's uh, something called ARM R that's a no MMU version of ARM. There's a bunch of no MMU different platforms, but they weren't coordinating. And that's, well, that's the old story of fragmentation. You, you need to fix that, and, and we're doing that. So this main page on noMMU.org, which we said that we would be putting up last time, and now you know, there's some basic information up there, um, and a couple of sublinks is if you want to know, okay, how if I have a NOMMU Linux system, I want to write a C program for it, how does this differ from writing for one with an MMU? And they're not particularly big differences, but you have to be aware of them. So this basically walks you through you know, what the differences are and how to port from MMU to NOMMU. Uh, the other a subdirectory under here, which is actually, this is an incorrect place for this subdirectory. We're giving it its own domain and moving it out. The nomu.org website is supposed to be uh, target agnostic. Okay? Um, Yoshinori Sato is reviving the H8300 architecture. That's another nomu architecture. We should equally support that as supporting uh, jcore on the nomu.org website. So we're separating those projects. And we have a j-core.org uh, website that we'll be moving this page to. But for the moment, that's where it is. This is basically what the tutorial today is going to be about. This walks you through um, getting a Numato board. We actually mentioned two other boards, but the Numato boards are, are way easier. Um, you know, it basically goes, you know, okay, J2 open processor, why? What is this processor? Uh, quick start on actual hardware. Step one, get some hardware. And it's like, yeah, the Numato boards are pretty much what we're pointing people at now. We used to use AV net boards, but they cost twice as much. And you have to get additional hardware to add an SD card. And it's really convenient to be able to boot Linux from the SD card rather than trying to flash the kernel image into flash each time through JTAG. And uh, we made our own in-house board that we use for development of uh, products based on this. We are open sourcing things that we developed along the way to making other commercial projects. And we basically went, okay, where's the line of what should be out there that everybody has access to? And what are the bits that are our proprietary advantage? And we, our proprietary advantage bits are actually you know, pretty small. They're really elaborate math that I don't understand, although Jeff does. But the, the vast majority of what we've done, like three quarters of the VHDL we've written, is you know, open source going upstream. And we've made it modular so that we can add proprietary subdirectories. Basically, if you have a system on chip, you can add peripherals to it. Here's, here's the processor. Or you can configure to have two processors and be SMP. Um, you can 
configure the build system to say, I want this much dcache, I want this much iCache, I want this many serial ports at this location, I want, you know, I, I need the SD card uh, implementation, I need an Ethernet implementation. And the way the configuration system works is when you have a physical board, the manufacturer will have on their web page something called a netlist. It's a text file that says, this register corresponds to this pin of the hardware. So that when you're building your bitstream, it knows, okay, send these signals out on that pin, and that will talk to this hardware attached to the outside world. So every time uh, we port it to a new board, and Jeff is the one who's done most of it, but he, on the mailing list, has described the process of porting to a new board. We, we need to get a new board and port to it and you know write up what we actually actually did. So if anybody else, you know, I have an FPGA board lying around. I'd love to port this to that thing. Well, if it's got enough you know, physical capacity to hold the processor, uh, it should work. So anyway, we built our own board that has what's called an LX9 instead of, sorry. This board has what's called an LX9. It's uh, an FPGA from a company called Xilinx that has ballpark of 9,000 gates. The LX45 has a ballpark of 45,000 gates, about seven times the capacity. I'm oversimplifying a bit there. Uh, you can ask Jeff about it afterwards if you want to know the actual nitty gritty details. But there's enough space in this cheap low end board to hold an instance of our processor a serial peripheral uh, DRAM controller, you know, some the basic plumbing of, of being a system, and then there's enough left for Ethernet or cache. Pick one. And at that point you filled it up. And you can't do SMP on these because there's not enough um, there's not enough gates on the FPGA to, to store two instances of the processor. So we actually have SMP working in other contexts, but we had to come up with our own board for that. Um, LX45 boards are historically very expensive. One of the things that we're thinking of doing is uh, launching a Kickstarter, where we would design our own LX45 board that's outwardly compatible with like a Raspberry Pi P+, only instead of an ARM processor, it would have an FPGA in the middle, and we would use the high-end LX45 FPGA and try to make enough of them that they could be cheap, because unit volume and cost you know, are directly related. The higher the unit volume, the lower the, the per cost. So for the moment we're using the Numata board, you should all have one in front of you. Um, you should have a USB cable and you should have an SD card. I'm told that we only brought one of the bags of SD cards. Uh, that is that is my fault. If, uh, if you're short an SD card, you may need to borrow one from somebody else to boot the actual kernel because the VM Linux image, the we have a bootloader as part of the bitstream that gets flashed into the board's onboard ROM, but that bootloader loads Linux from the SD card. That's what it's configured to do. It's got a couple of other modes like TFTP and stuff, but there's no Ethernet hardware on here, so uh, SD card is pretty much the only option. And um, so we'll be copying a VM Linux image on that to actually boot your board to a shell from at the end of the tutorial. So once you have a board, the next thing you need to do is get and install a build stream. Now, the VM Linux image is software that runs in the J2 processor. It's essentially more or less SH2 instructions. It's Super H instructions. And so you cross-compile a kernel for SH2 with a an init RAMFS image containing BusyBox configured to work with an OMMU system, also built with the same cross compiler. And you stick it in a VM Linux image and you put it on the SD card and the bootloader boots it and gives you a console on serial mode. That's the VM Linux image. The bitstream is what loads into the FPGA to tell it to be a J2 processor. That's what tells this programmable hardware what hardware to be. Okay, you could feed it a different bit stream and make it be an ARM processor or a MIPS processor or just a video card, you know, or something else. 
Um, actually, you'd have a little trouble making the video card because I don't think it has the right I.O. pins. But you can take these little like, GPIO headers on the end and solder your own thing that goes in with VGA adapter. It actually has a VGA adapter on it. Okay, so you could, you could actually make it be a VGA video card if you wanted to. Um, I don't think we've wired up the VGA pins in our thing because we didn't bother to make a video card because we don't have the gates to spare to do that. But if it had an LX45 in it, sure, we could do that. Um, but the problem would really be the memory for the frame buffer, I think. That, that, that's, a, that's a question for Jeff Young, who's not here. He actually looked into doing it, and it is doable, but that's more for the Kickstarter than for this one. So in the source code for Linux is C. And you build it with a cross compiler. And we have pre-built cross compilers that you can just download the binary off. Or if you want to download the script that builds the compiler, you can build it from source. The compiler we have right now is based on the last GPLv2 releases, because since this is an old processor architecture that essentially stopped being updated many years ago, we just went with the old known working versions. And we also just, at a company level, we didn't want to worry about distributing GPLv3 binaries and you know explaining to our lawyers uh, the intricacies of that. Um, but there's a new tool chain that's being uh, developed by Rich Felker, the muscle latency maintainer. We've, uh, we've hired him as a consultant to uh, work with us to add SH2 support to his C library. And he's also um, putting together a tool chain and pushing patches upstream for, for things that broke. Um, one of the things about uh, NoMMU programming is that, which is on this, this top level page, is that you can't use standard ELF binaries. Because ELF has in it, what memory address do I load each segment at? Which is great if you've got a memory management unit remapping virtual addresses to physical addresses. If you don't, every program sees the same addresses. Now, it may have some, you know, a, a low watermark and a high watermark, so here's the only window of the memory you're allowed to look at right now. It may have a little bit of basic security, but it doesn't have the ability to have two different programs see, two di you know, see the same address meaning two different things. It doesn't have that piece of hardware. And what that means is we can't use standard ELF. We need to either create uh, what's called bin flat binaries, which are basically the old a.out format with some extra tables that tell the segments how to be relocated. Um, you know, it's basically a pick version of a.out. Or there's one called fdpick, which is the same thing done to elf, teaching elf binaries to allow the segments to be individually relocated. And Rich Falker, uh, the muscle lipstick maintainer, is actually enthused about this because he believes that it is of use to systems with MMUs as a security measure. It's basically ASLR on steroids. You know, if every segment can be individually randomly relocated and you know the, the dynamic loader does the fix-ups to, to figure it all out, that makes it really hard to turn a buffer overflow into something usable. Okay. So back to this page. Um, if you are going to build the bitstream from the VHDL source code, and we have a release version of, uh, you know, here's the tarball. The, the git link is still a to-do item because, I, as I mentioned, I'm converting the material to git. Uh, it, the hard part isn't converting the material to git. The hard part is merging the sub-repos into a single repository so that I can convert the single mercurial repository into the single git repository. Unfortunately, git has sucked enough users away from mercurial that doing that kind of thing over on the mercurial side isn't well documented or well supported anymore. That's another reason that you know moving our in-house to the development to get someday might be a good idea, might not be. Uh, the developers prefer Mercurial. Um, so the Zion's Bitstream compiler, there is a big long page. The Zion's Bitstream compiler is it's sort of analogous to when uh, Netscape was a free download but was binary, or the Flash plugin was a free download but was binary, and people were working to reverse engineer it, there are actually a 
three different projects that are doing very good work in creating fully open source midstream compilers capable of building the HDL. The problem is none of them are good enough to build our stuff yet. It's like building the kernel with LLVM. People have been working on it, but actually making it work, you know, building the kernel with PCC would be a better analogy. It's, this is the future, but it's a ways away. Um, one of the things that we actually want to do on the, uh, the software side, um, I mentioned that Rich Felder is, is doing newer tool chains based on GCC 5.2 and stuff. After he gets that working, we need somebody to work on an LLVM tool chain. Because LLVM never got Super H support. So we should add it. So if you want to install this midstream compiler, um, it's awkward. You know how Dell can't write a BIOS to save their life? If you've ever used software that comes from hardware companies and software is not particularly what they do, they made it work, but there are successful code paths that you stay with and you don't wander off that path so much. Unfortunately, this is, this is one of those things. The, the command line tools are actually fairly robust. Um, we're using an older version of what's called ISE Webpack, and we're using the command line tools because those have had thousands and thousands of people bang on them for well over a decade. They've squeezed the obvious bugs out of that. Um, Xilinx would really like us to upgrade to the newer versions of their FPGA hardware that they've undergone a die shrink, and that requires a new tool chain with it. And we basically went the new tool chain is deal breaker. This, this is a pain to install, but this is very elaborate instructions on you download the four tarballs, you do these things, and if anything doesn't work, email me or email the mailing list. We have mailing list. We have one for the Zero PF project, which is, Zero PF is the open processor foundation. Um, Basically, the original Super H architect, back when it was a proprietary project and a proprietary company, um, semi-retired and we hired, as a, hired him as a consultant and had him put together a standards body. So if other people wanted to add additional instructions to this, it's not just us doing it, people can participate in an actual process. Because one of the things we're going to be doing, we're adding SMP support now, which is fairly straightforward, but then we need to extend it to 64-bit. Well, what does extending it to 64-bit mean? You know, there's, there's new things we want to do with this processor, and we're working on that. So I believe there's a link to that at the, uh, at the top of the page. Um, oh, sorry, it's not, on, it's not this page. It's the uh, page above that has the uh, Yes, zero PF mailing list. Um, so yes, it's the Open Processor Foundation. Uh, it's zero PF instead of OPF because the Orangutan Protection Foundation beat us to the domain name. So, okay. Oh, okay. Oh, the, and the marketing guys are going, the zero stands for zero licensing fees. Okay. Right. Um, so you get some hardware, you get an installed bitstream. If you install the bitstream compiler, actually building the VHDL from source is pretty straightforward. And towards the end of this, I may ask Jeff to just you know, show you some VHDL source and show you what it's like. It is a programming language. The thing about VHDL is it is a lot more like software development than like traditional hardware development. That's why we're trying to recruit software developers into this, because we believe software developers have the potential of doing a better job. Um, the, where is, the set of slides. Um, the slides actually mention, yeah, why can we create an existing architecture? Because we're leveraging a massive existing outlet. It already works, we just have to dust it off a little bit. Patent expiration is, you know, the reason we can do this now. Why Super H? Well, because in terms of code density, Super H was one of the best ones ever. In fact, the ARM, uh, the thumb instruction set that ARM used, they licensed patents from Hitachi from the Super H technology in order to implement the thumb instructions. And those are the patents that expired, so thumb may get a little cheaper, although I doubt they'll pass the savings on to us. 
Um, yeah, the basic uh, design, if you're, if you're into the hardware stuff, that's cool. Um, basically, I would start with like peripherals, you know, implement your own serial port and stuff like that, and you know, learn the basic language and then start digging into the, the rest of the stuff. But we do have um, some documentation on the build system. Um, I can ask Jeff to talk about that because that's, that's his baby. Uh, so, just kind of a meta point, how much time did you want to allot for lecture versus actual tutorial? If we're not installing the Xilinx toolchain, mm -hmm. half the time okay. was going to be taken up by installing the Xilinx toolchain. And the problem is, when I, when I sat down to copy the toolchain files onto this thing so that you know, I could pass it around rather than having to download it, it took half an hour to copy the files once. So if you pass it right in, it, we just can't do well, that. We could at least pass it around and start. If anybody would like to copy it, the, the, the page, the page basically says, you know, download the four chunks of ISC Webpack. If you, if you go to this page, it actually has, here are the four files to install. The reason you want the four separate ones instead of the one big one, as, as I mentioned on the page, is that Xilinx wrote a JavaScript downloader that they are extremely proud of that stops hard at 1 to the 31 bytes. So at exactly 2 gigs, it thinks it's done. The one big version is almost 8 gigs. Yeah. So there's a lot of the stuff like that in Xilinx. The, the people who've been doing this for a long time know where the stepping stones that hold weight are. What I did is I documented, here are the stepping stones that hold weight that actually get the toolchain installed. Once the toolchain is installed, you never have to look at it again. And hopefully in two to three years, we'll be able to migrate everybody to an actual open source one of these. Um, but not a moment. So yeah, if anybody would like to start copying the things, it, it, it saves you a very big download. And afterwards, if you want me to walk you through that thing, I can. It's just what what I really wanted to do was uh, copy it all onto all of the SD cards uh, before I handed out the SD cards. But a, we don't have enough USB to SD adapters for everyone, and b, the SD cards are one gig and this is eight gigs data. We have not actually given this tutorial before, and when we sat down to try to put the things together, it's like, yes, we've made all of these pieces work, but explaining it to someone new, it's like, oh, right, that thing, that thing. Okay, so the thing that you can do is, instead of downloading the Bitstream source code, you can download a pre-built known working binary. And that's what we're gonna do here. We, we can download, you know, copy link address or wget nomu.org slash jcore slash numato.bin. That's like, I forget if it's 300k or 3 megabytes. It's, I think it's like 300k. It, it's not that big. It contains a complete instance of our processor, but it's a smallish thing. Um, if I had the other machine out, I would actually run through the build through you to show you, hey, this is what the build looks like. You type make like almost anything else, you know. Um, and Jeff has actually added a make help target now. Oh, but that's not in the release we did. That's in the version of GitHub because that commit was newer than the release version. But um, it's like any other it's like any other source code. You build a binary from human readable text source. Uh, the difference is that the target is hardware rather than the target being software. But pretty much. So once you get that, then what we need to do is we need to flash it onto the board. And flashing the bitstream onto the board, another nice thing about Numato is instead of having to mess around with a JTAG, they actually provide a Python script that will, through the USB connector, there's a, there's a switch right here. If you all look on your board, there's a switch that flips up and flips down. I believe flipping it down puts it in programming mode and flipping it up puts it in run mode, but I could have that backwards. But basically what we do is we flip that switch into programming mode 
plug in the USB connector and run the Python script that Yamato provided with, yeah. So sudo python mimus v2 config pi dev ttyacm 0 yamato.bin. The main downside of this script is it's Python 3 rather than Python 2, and we haven't had the opportunity to backport it yet. It's on our to-do list. If anybody else would like to do this for us, we would be you know, extremely grateful. Uh, we'll, we intend to get around to it at some point, but you know, we're making SMP work, and we're implementing uh, DSPs that we're also going to open source, digital signal processors that you, know, you can add inside this thing with a ring bus that does high-speed data processing and signal analysis and all sorts of cool things. Um, and again, we've decided that the DSPs themselves are not proprietary. We're releasing them under the same uh, MIT license. It's the code that runs on the DSPs is our proprietary interest. Mm -hmm. So basically what you, what you do is up here we mentioned that Numato provides a GPL licensed Python 3 tool to flash bit streams onto the board but it has a bug that prevents it from working on 64-bit systems. They developed it on 32-bit windows. And it works on, but there's a, there's a simple fix. And if you download this version instead of the first one, it, it applies the fix. It's like a one-character fix telling it to use a long instead of an int or something like that, or an int instead of a long. Um, and that basically means that the, the data protocol it's talking isn't in, incorrectly passed. But, so we're going to be downloading a bit stream. We're going to be hooking the board up with USB. I note that the board is powered by USB. So when you plug it in, it, it'll start booting up if the switch is in the, the run position instead of in the oven. You have to flip the switch before you apply power to put it in programming mode. And then we run the thing, we flash the thing on it, and then we flip it the other way, and it will start booting up. Now, what it will initially boot into is the ROM bootloader I mentioned tries to load VM Linux from the SD card. The, the ROM Linux will, the, the ROM, uh, the ROM bootloader will start by running CPU tests and will actually output some data to the serial port, saying that the CPU test passed and now it's trying to open the file on the VM Linux thing. And if you don't have an SD card in it, you can still tell that you flashed it properly because you will get some serial output from the built-in ROM bootloader. So we can break these steps up. Yeah, I, I, would, I would demonstrate building, but this is a very low-end netbook that has the advantage of having a VGA output. And Work gave me a Mac. I mentioned the package not going through on the Mac, although the new orange boards should fix that. But um, the downside of that is I need an adapter that I don't have in order to put video here. So, thing. We have something beyond this. Good to know. <laughs> um, so, let's. So, I tell you how to hook up a serial console. I mean, serial consoles aren't hugely, you know, esoteric. However, this device only hooked up two wires. They hooked up the, the data read and data write wires. They did not hook up any flow control wires. There's no RTS, CTS, or anything like that which means you have to run the SDTY tool to disable RTS-CTS, and then you can connect a common board to the thing and actually get data. And I just use the microcom that's built into BusyBox because I have it lying around. I used to maintain BusyBox, so this is really easy for you to play with. Um, you can actually wget the Busy... Does, there, does anybody here not know how to wget uh, pre-built BusyBox binaries for like x86-64? Cool. So, you know, we can just grab that and that's a known working thing. Um, other people use microcom, other people use the serial connector that's built into the Mac. Um, just use this. So, first thing we do is we get the, okay, the SD card is not actually in the board. So let's start by putting the board in program mode. Um, okay. Almost everybody here has a Linux laptop, right? I mentioned that on the on the thing. Who does not have a Linux laptop? Okay. Um, in theory, the program, the, the Python script, 
runs on Windows, although I've never tried it. I know it doesn't run on Mac. Well, it runs on Mac. It doesn't work on Mac. It says that it's flashed the board, and no actual flashing occurred, and I don't know why. Um, this is after Jeff. Basically, it, it initially does a, a fault where something returned nil, where it expected it to return an int. And Jeff just patched that to return uh, an int from there. And so it, 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 it needs to be debugged on Mac, and I haven't gotten around to that. Um, although Numato has very good tech support. If you go to the Numato website, um, up here, the Numato Mimas V2 web page, at the bottom, has, oh, they're back in stock. We ordered all of their stock last week. No, no, don't care. Um, but down at the bottom, there is, um, there is support. Well, someone here, there's a support link, and it's actually, they're, they're pretty good. I think it's under contact. Um, yeah, con um, contact us. Oh, sorry, no, help and support right there. So if you have a problem with you know, this script on Mac, for example, you can, you can email them, and they're, they usually reply the same day, and they do have engineers who actually support this board. So it's another reason we use this one, because it's you know, very nice. So we wanted to fix some stuff ourselves, but you could probably just contact them, get them to fix it, if they're going to work Conceptually, it's nice to have this. So let's go back to, OK. So if we go to the normanu.org slash jcore page, and those of you have a Linux, who have a Linux system, this should work. Um, those of you who have a Windows system, it might work. Those of you who have a Mac, good luck. Those of you who don't have any computer at all, well, you can watch the thing and maybe try it at home. Um, now, the main downside of it being in Python 3 is you do have to install Python 3. Nobody ever has Python 3 already. And you have to install Pi Serial for Python 3 as well. I, I list the uh, command line to do so on Ubuntu. Um, yeah, apt-get install Python 3 and Python 3-serial. Um, if you're doing that on a different distro, presumably it's analogous. So we flip the switch, uh, the black switch on the board, towards the USB side. So we flip it towards the USB connector. This is the flash position. We assume that you've downloaded the one at this link. Let me just wget the fresh copy off the website, so I'm using the same one you are. ACM0 is what the serial port shows up as under Ubuntu. Uh, it might show up differently under you know, a Mac. It's just that's what the USB serial driver decided to name the device. Work. Hmm. Well, you can 
we ended up in. Right into flash. 2% complete, 3% complete. So it's working for me. Is anybody trying it and not having it work for them? Because I can help you debug this before we move on. How many people is it working for? How many people have tried? <laughs> <laughs> well, you can watch the video again at home. And you have the hardware. Uh, so 36, 37, 38. Uh, the next thing that we're going to do is I can walk you through building a simple Linux kernel, but do you already know how to build a simple Linux kernel? I mean, I'm going to be posting an updated set of patches for the 4.2 kernel. Um, probably Sunday. My flight back's Monday, right? Yep. Okay, so probably Sunday I will be porting, uh, posting an updated set of patches to the uh, the zero pf at millimenu.org mailing list. And there's a web, web archive for that. So I will include instructions on how to build a Linux kernel from source, including uh, a, a busy box in RAMFS that runs on this board. Um, I could go through that right now, but I've used up a lot of time and I want to actually get to uh, have Jeff show you some what PHPL source looks like because what I really want to do, it's great to get people using the, U the Linux side of this and programming for SH2, but what we'd really like to do is get people interested in playing around with FPGA hardware programs. Because the thing about FPGAs, um, I, I breezed through the initial slides and I didn't give you the payoff. The same build system that produces an FPGA bitstream, a different make target, basically running it through a different linker, builds an ASIC mask. Well, it builds an ASIC source file that you then send to a fab and they frown at it and make a mask out of it. But the same build system can be used to produce actual ASIC chips. And one of the things that we're doing right now is we're looking at, you know, taping out a test chip sometime next year to, you know, if we do that Kickstarter, we're trying to figure out, should it just have the larger FPGA or should it actually have an ASIC version of this processor and an FPGA that lets you, you know, attach a whole bunch of processors and a whole bunch of DSPs and peripherals. Does it make sense to just do a larger FPGA? In, in, in mind, we're still we're still talking about that. Um, so how did it do on the flash? Oh, it's done. Okay. So at this point, what we do is we get this, and I note that you will almost certainly have to do sudo to make these two work because for some reason the serial port doesn't always belong to the login user. So just it's easy to do sudo bin bash and then paste this thing. I should probably update these. Um, I should test whether it works. But um, okay, so I unplug the board after it is flashed. I flip the switch to the other direction. You'll note there is no SD card plugged in. And I do the paste. And you'll notice it won't let me do it yet because the, the USB shows up when I plug it in. So there's sort of a window where I do this and then I cursor up and I hit enter. Whoops, exit, no. There. So I plug it in, the device shows up, and then I hit that. And then I should have, so I'm not touching any of the pins. Ha! Run L failed. It's basically saying I attempted to load the VM on the next image and it wasn't there. Because there's no SD card. But you'll notice it said, you know, here is the CPU test pass. Here's the GDB stub for HS2J0SH2ROM. Uh, uh, the GDB stub is a JTAG thing that allows you to connect GDB to the actual hardware. If you've played around with actual embedded hardware development, you know, there's that thing. It's a little buggy in this release. We're, we're fixing it. Um, like, 
one time out of 50 that you read register contents, it gives you the wrong register contents because there's some sort of race condition you just haven't tracked it on because the hardware is already working. We're not currently using the JPEG. But if somebody else wanted to look at this, or we should get to it sometime in the new year. Um, so yes, so I unplug it. And now what we do is we get this thing in the USB adapter. I have three adapters here if anybody else needs to do this part. Cool. And what we do is we plug it in. And I mentioned that there's the, uh, I'm going to post the instructions on how to build the kernel and user space from source to mailing list. I already posted the kernel patches to let you build a kernel, but it just points it in an ramifest directory and assumes that you have a, an SH2 root file system and you probably don't. So let's grab a VM Linux that we have lying around that is known to work on the board. So there's a VM Linux image on the Zero PF website. So let's click on that. I'm slowly moving the links from the standards body website to the website here because the standards body website is running WordPress and if you try to wash binary files through WordPress, it wants to help out in the kitchen and it can screw them up. So sometimes it takes us like five attempts to get a file up just because it wants to you know, do something. I think they had to gzip this one in order to make it not confused. So, Oops. I'm now just used enough used enough to my Mac keyboard that I do the wrong chord combination and I keep switching terminals. Zcat that to <coughs> file at first and see if it is actually gzipped or if that was just yeah, it's gzipped. So Zcat. So sudo mount dev sd actually message to see. I uh, I disabled the pop up when I plug USB in because I find it annoying. So it's sdb. I think it's sdb. Yeah. There we go. So what I can do is there's a VM Linux that's already on there, but I will delete that one. the only file it looks at. It doesn't care what else is on the card. It tries to open and read. The bootloader is 8K of ROM. So the bootloader doesn't have a whole lot of brains. It has just enough to talk to the SD card through an MMC bus, parse a fat file system where the first partition at the top level has a file called VM Linux, load it into memory, and then um, VM Linux is, is the ELF output of the Linux kernel build. It's not packaged in any way for like U-boot or anything like that. It's not a BC image, it's ELF. So it has a tiny little ELF loader that basically just traverses a couple of linked lists to do the fix-ups. And then it jumps to the start of it and Linux takes over from there. So, let's try. I know there's a slot here. Oh, here it is. Okay. Where did I put my serial? Oh, it's on here. So we get the same serial command as before. The power of command history is pretty as well. should actually be able to find the SD card and open VM Linux OK. It's loading it. Um, I know that our MMC driver is doing single byte reads, so that's not a hardware side thing, that's a kernel side thing, so we need to fix that. Um, a lot of the hardware, we got it working, but it could be optimized. We just did you know, fairly simple ones first off. So this is Linux booting on this board, running the ministry. 
Um, I know that the init scripts here are kind of, um, well, the init scripts here are for our in-house board that has Ethernet on it. So it's going, if config, not found. It's like, yeah, there's, there's no Ethernet hardware. But uh, it's root and min. Root and min. Hey. Root. So it's not the world's fastest thing, but it's a $50 piece of programmable hardware. And if we did an ASIC on this thing, the thing about doing ASICs is new cutting edge fab uh, technology that's good, that would be blazing fast is really expensive. But the old cheap stuff that's like, they built this fab 15 years ago and they're looking for an excuse not to tear it down and do a newer version because that costs them billions of dollars. As long as they can keep it you know, operating, they'll give you a good deal. That fab stuff is really cheap. We were working out um, if we wanted to do a Kickstarter. Um, Jeff Dion is doing a keynote at ELC Europe on this stuff. And some of the math we did for that is that if you have a $60,000 Kickstarter, you can, it takes about, with the, with the guys we talked to, um, using a 150 nanometer process, which is from 2000, um, making a mask costs $40,000. And then running off a wafer costs something like $2,100, and then that much again to you know, test and dice and mount the chips into individual chips. And the smallest lot of wafers they'll run off is six wafers, which add, you know, he did more math, and it's like you can expect like a 92% yield from this process, and it worked out to 36,000 chips for 60 grand. And it's going to get cheaper as time goes on. That is within range of hobbyists. And in fact, we know it's within range of hobbyists because all the Bitcoin movies are already doing this. You know, they're already doing their own ASICs. But you don't need to do an ASIC any more than you need to press CDs to ship your distro. If you have the FPGA, you can do all the, all the development and then feed it up to somebody else who's going to you know, be the red hat who does the quarterly releases. Here's the new ASIC. I will you know, give you my $3. OK? So questions? OK, if there's any time left, I would like to get Jeff Salmon up to show you some examples of VHDL. Because VHDL is actually really cool. We're using a variant of VHDL that was designed by the European Space Agency. Um, you know, there, some of these slides are why VHDL, not Verilog. VHDL is basically a high-level language. Verilog is sort of machine language for the hardware. It, you know, this wire connects to that wire. This wire connects to that wire. With VHDL, you're going, okay, I'm putting, you know, here's an array of signals 0 to 6. And I'm putting a 3 out on this wire. And then the type of this wire is, you know, this range 0 to 6. And it lets the tool figure out, well, how do you actually encode that? You know, is that multiple voltage levels? Is that some sort of serial thing? Do you have multiple wires that you're cording together in a parallel thing? It's like, you don't have to care. A lot of the low-level hardware decisions are abstracted away in VHDL. The problem is, if you came up from the hardware side, having the hardware decisions that you trained on abstracted away by the tool creeps hardware developers out and they don't want to go. So they're, they're the people who are writing assembly language in C, because you can. Um, we're trying to get software people to do VHDL because software people will use VHDL better, because it's software. Okay. And I hand over to Jeff. How much time do you have? One hour. Hmm? One hour. One hour. One hour. Should we be so up trying to should we help people? We can. Or the other thing we could do is we could take a short break before this so everybody can use the vending machines. You know, if you wanted to have five minutes to set up. Yeah, that's a good idea.
Okay. Okay. Could we take a five-minute break? So